My name is Ann Purvis and I'm one of the leaders of the Toronto Field Naturalist Juniors Program. Today was the fifth nature class in a 10-week series. If you haven't joined us yet, please do. We would love to have you. This is a photo of a drawing made by Toby of an eastern cottontail rabbit. I challenged the group to guess where he had seen the eastern cottontail. It was in his grandparents' garden and it was eating their plants. Sonia submitted this drawing of a Blackburnian warbler, which she did in Sandra Iskandar's nature art class a couple of weeks ago. The Blackburnian warbler is a treasure of the songbird migration. We look forward to seeing this wonderful bird every year. I will also take the chance to say that there has been a uh, change in the schedule and we won't be drawing the Blackburnian warbler next week, which a lot of people uh, did already in the art class. Instead, I've asked each student to bring a piece of plastic. It could be a shampoo bottle or whatever, and we're going to talk about how things get recycled, but also how we can reduce using plastic altogether. So I put the insects at the beginning of the show this week um, as a place of honor for them. I was so happy to see this mining bee, probably an adrena or a colides, uh, covered with pollen. The spring has come early this year in Ontario and a lot of fruit trees have budded out. Fruit trees and flower are wonderful for mining bees, but it is dangerous if, if the trees get a frost. Our cherry tree was out in bloom this week and I saw a large bumblebee taking advantage of it. This is a service berry bud down here. Natasha and Toby saw this Compton's tortoiseshell butterfly in the Dawn Valley. The white spot on the leading edge of the hind wing is uh, diagnostic for the Compton's. It is a close relative of the comma and the question mark. They are in the brushfoot family. So the brushfoots all have four large legs that they use for walking and the two front legs are modified and covered with hairs. Compton's overwinters just like the comma butterfly. And I suddenly wondered whether they are also dependent on forest floor ephemerals in the spring when they come out of hibernation. I challenged the group as to why this bird is called a cedar waxwing. Sonia correctly guessed that waxwing comes from the waxy tips of the wings which actually fall off at some point during the season. Cedar, someone else, Amara, I believe, guessed that this bird eats the cedar tree, and that is true. It eats the blueberries of the eastern red cedar. They also use the berries in their courtship rituals, passing the berries back and forth. This bird is very social, so even after it forms a pair with another individual, it will still feed in the large flock that it was originally part of. I was curious, wondering why this blue jay had cocked its head. Both its ear and its eye are on the side of its head. And I think, in the next picture, he's hopped down on the ground. So I think he's studying what the squirrel is doing and realizing that there's a source of food down there. The bird on the left is really familiar to us. American Robin is collecting nesting materials here. The bird on the right is a veery, which has a very haunting call, haunting descending call that we love to hear echoing through the forest. The robin and the veery are close cousins. They're first cousins. They're both thrushes. I find it so interesting that two members of the same family could have adapted to such different environments. So the American Robin is very comfortable in city gardens and city parks and the Veery needs a moist deciduous forest to make its home. The Veery overwinters in Brazil, just a couple of places in Brazil, and it is a very very efficient flyer. So apparently it can flap basically all night and it can travel up to 285 kilometers in one night. So I challenged the group how many different species you can see here and the first thing that comes to that that draws our attention is the four black male red winged blackbirds. I was curious why the red is so 
uh, muted in these birds. They're not immatures or anything. Apparently, male red wings don't display unless they're aggressive or uh, territorial or in courtship situations. So they often uh, cover the, the red shoulders that are sometimes so prominent. Behind them is a brown-headed cowbird, and over on the left is uh, a female red wing that looks a lot like a sparrow. The chipmunk is also helping himself to whatever it is on the ground that they're eating. I see a pine cone here, so it's possible that the, the, there's seeds from an evergreen. So this is a yellow shafted flicker on the left, which is a type of woodpecker. It has the tail that it sits on while it works on trees. I asked the group whether they think this flicker was responsible for these holes on the right. And I think the answer is no. I think a yellow-bellied sapsucker made these holes since they're so systematically um, placed uh, just a couple of centimeters from each other. So we were wondering about whether this is pollution or not in the Don River. I asked Zunaid Khan, who is on the board at the Toronto Field National Center, is very familiar with the Earl Bales Park. He said that this can be a naturally occurring foam, foam caused by fatty acids that change the surface tension of the water and cause bubbles to form. If it is natural, then it occurs in spring and fall in the early morning, but it can also be pollution. And I realize that I've seen this kind of foam on beaches on the Great Lakes. So the flower on the right really confused me when I first saw this picture submitted by Marina and Sonia. Yes, I thought this cannot be a dandelion gone to seed. It's still got pollen on it. Uh, then Marina told me that it was a colt's foot, and we have this lovely photo of the colt's foot submitted by Amara. So this is a colt's foot gone to seed, and these are the remains of the petals on the ends of these feathery parachutes. So the flower in the middle is a forest floor plant from Europe. It can make a wonderful ground cover here in spring, and we do see it in large patches, sometimes under trees in our parks. The other two flowers are violets. We only see these in the spring, so we have just a short time to get a good look at them. Violets have five petals. The one at the bottom has stripes on it, which are a nectar guide to show insects where the nectar is hidden. So nectar is hidden at the base of the fifth petal. You can also see these hairs on each side. So as the insect is entering and following the nectar guides down to the nectar, these feathery bits would remove the pollen that it's collected from other plants that it's visited. And because it has to go so deep into the plant, it would pick up the pollen that has been shed um, deeper into the plant below the pistol. This is forget-me-not. So these are both last year's plants. The thistles on the left are a biennial, so they make this rosette the first year, and the second year they will shoot up a stalk and a flower, and then they die. The flower on the right is called thimbleweed. It's, um, it's an anemone, and I'm surprised to see that it still has these feathery parachutes on, on the seeds that they haven't blown away yet. The seed head looks like a thimble, which is where it gets its name from. So Marina and Sonia saw this skunk in the, the, the forest across from their home. So skunks hibernate all winter and um, mate when they emerge in the March. It is about now that the babies are born. So if a, if a skunk is going to spray, apparently it makes a U shape with both head and tail facing the enemy and releases the spray. A good remedy for this is vinegar and dish detergent, better than the old tomato juice bath that we used to hear about. So today we're gonna focus, we focused on white-tailed deer in celebration of Mother's Day. We talked about the first day of a fawn's life. Um, here is a newborn fawn nursing, and here is, here is a photo of an older fawn. The photographer that took these photos was Chris Thayer from uh, Minnesota, and he was delighted to let us use these pictures. So we 
We learned about the fawn by doing a dramatic reading together.